I wanted to welcome everyone to uh, this lecture on a sustainable future for the tropics. This is one of the final events in our month-long Good Science Equals Great Business Festival. Um, and if the other James Cook University events are anything to go by, um, it'll be fantastic. So I'd like to invite our Deputy High Commissioner, Kate Duff, to uh, come and introduce our speaker, Sandra Harding. Thanks. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you so much, Carolyn, and uh, welcome very much to uh, the fantastic James Cook University team here tonight, particularly uh, University Chancellor, Mr Bill Tudell, uh, Deputy Chancellor, uh, Cam Charlton. Uh, welcome, of course, to Professor Sandra Harding, Vice-Chancellor and President of, of JCU, and to Provost Professor Chris Cochran and all of the fabulous staff and colleagues from JCU that we know so well. And to everybody else, good evening and welcome. We're delighted to have you here, as Carolyn said, the final week, yes, we've nearly made it, <laughs> a marathon of our Good Science Equals Great Business 2018, Australia's Innovation Festival in Singapore and ASEAN. And it really has been a fantastic month, continues to be and I think has happily exceeded our expectations in all the right ways. This evening we have the honour and pleasure of hearing from James Cook University Vice-Chancellor and President, as I mentioned, Professor Sandra Harding, on the complex and important topic of a sustainable future for the tropics. But first, please bear with me while I touch on a few points on our Good Science Equals Great Business Festival. Firstly, of course, James Cook University has been a vital part to the success of the festival. Right from the get-go, I can tell you, they shared our vision for what we could achieve as partners here in Singapore, and they quickly helped us bring it all to fruition. We thank James Cook University for being a platinum sponsor, but we also thank James Cook University for its involvement or delivery of no less than seven festival events, including the much-anticipated launch tomorrow of the Tropical Futures Institute, where Australia's Minister for Industry, Science and Technology, the Honourable Karen Andrews MP, will also join us, and that's just tremendous. It's also my, it was also my great pleasure to officiate, I think, at JCU's first uh, festival event, the expert panel series on seafood security. You never know what you're going to learn, but I learnt a lot that night and it was tremendous. So thank you to Professor Jerry and colleagues here who assisted with that. But other lectures and events have covered health innovations, the Internet of Things, as well as our fantastic Women Innovation panel event, which was a, a great evening. So congratulations to the JCU team. At its conclusion this coming Friday, our festival will have delivered over 40 individual opportunities for engagement and exchanges across September, showcasing the best in Australian science. I want to thank and acknowledge all of our festival collaborators for helping to us to achieve this outcome. Our festival partners, CSIRO, who have now opened an office here in Singapore, located in the High, High Commission, Ostcham Singapore, thank you, and Australian Trade Commission, thank you very much. Our festival sponsors have provided generous support. James Cook University is joined as a platinum sponsor by the Australian National University. Our gold sponsors are Icon SOC and together with Curtin Singapore and Lend-Lease. Our silver sponsors are the Royal Melbourne Institute of Technology, the Australian Nuclear Science and Technology Organisation, which is holding an event on Friday. If you, you need more science, there's more to come on Friday. <laughs> the University of Queensland and Murdoch Singapore. So just briefly, why are we doing this science festival and what was our vision? What was the vision we had? Well, first we wanted to showcase what we, Australia, have to offer. We wanted to highlight the diversity and benefits of Australian science, highlight what our world-class universities and institutions are doing, and to highlight the significant investments that, that are being made by the Australian government in science. Secondly, we initiated the festival to ensure that we can take advantage of the tremendous things happening here in Singapore. Singapore's world-class universities and institutions are doing excellent work. Singapore has a thriving ecosystem of startups, incubators, investors, and a government invested in innovation. And of course, Singapore is host to many multinational corporations that are investing in this region and increasingly an in R&D. But thirdly, and I think most importantly, we decided that this festival was necessary because there's so much tremendous potential for Australia and Singapore to do more together as partners. In 2015, Australia and Singapore signed the Comprehensive Strategic Partnership to build a closer relationship, indeed an ever deeper partnership, between our two countries across a range of shared interests. Science and innovation is a key pillar of that partnership. And beyond Singapore, Australia has a strong and growing scientific partnership in our, with ASEAN member states. 
we see significant potential and we're putting in place the building blocks to support even greater collaboration, joined by important partners like JCU and from tomorrow, at least officially, it's Tropical Futures Institute. In her role as Vice-Chancellor, which Sandra Harding commenced in 20, uh, 2007, Professor Harding has worked across three locations, Cairns, Townsville and, and Townsville, and of course here in Singapore. Professor Harding was educated at the Australian National University, the University of Queensland, and North Car Carolina Institute in the US, a uh, university, sorry, in the United States. She's an economic sociolo so sociologist by training, and her enduring academic, academic interests include all sorts of topics, but most recently, I think, and as we've seen through the tremendous work of uh, JCU, I think a focus on issues related to the tropics, which we'll be focusing on tonight. It's been my very great pleasure, personally and professionally, to have been closely engaged with Professor Harding in one of the many roles that she plays in addition to her very, very busy role as Vice-Chancellor of JCU, and that was in the context of the Australian Government's New Colombo Plan Reference Group, on which Professor Harding continues to make a key contribution. Professor Harding's other current professional associations and roles include an impressive series of contributions to develop Northern Australia and the tropics. And I'm talking about institutions and uh, entities such as ACR, CEDA and various others. So a tremendously busy schedule, Professor Harding indeed. It's now my great pleasure to welcome Professor Harding to the stage to de deliver her lecture on a sustainable future for the tropics. Professor Harding, thank you. Thank you, Kate, very much, and uh, can I thank you very much for the opportunity to be here this evening and to speak about a topic which is very much close to the heart of our university and I think to the tropical nations of the world. Now, I know that there are people in the audience who will have heard some of this uh, previously, and so there are going to be some reminders um, in this for some of you, but I do hope there's enough here as a standalone to introduce you, if this is new to you, of the idea of the tropics and why it's important, and a little bit too about why our university is very much engaged in this task. I do have a series of PowerPoint slides for you and I hope I'll be able to make sure that I keep in touch with uh, moving through them as well so I'll be looking every now and then. Um, and so I will take you through these and I do believe at the end we will have some time for uh, some questions, comments or contributions that you might like to make and I look forward to that as well. So um, we'll get going. I guess first of all there's a bit of a spoiler alert, um, just where we're going to pretty much end up uh, is here. Um, Plainly, our view is that the tropics as a zone of the world is critically important. And we know, and I'll explain a little bit more about this at a level of detail, we know that global sustainability overall um, will depend on what happens in the tropics. There can be no doubt about that, and I'll show you some data in support of it. And our view is that universities, and particularly universities like ours, but universities that are located in the tropics or those that have a special interest in the tropics um, and research institutes too, have a special responsibility to work with, for, um, and, uh, you know, and, and to bring, with the peoples of the tropics, to bring to bear the benefit of our knowledge and our uh, training and our education on the issues that lie before the tropics. And more particularly, Australia and Singapore have a major a role to play. Uh, we are two developed or developing, depending on how you view these things, nations of the world in the tropics. We are advanced economies in the tropics. Of course, that's not typical in the tropics, and yet we do have major research institutes. We have major universities. Um, and while we can, of course, engage in a whole range of endeavours and areas, this is, this is something which is a unique opportunity for us and something that we should be thinking about making sure that we are focused upon. Why the tropics? Um, and again, some of you will have heard this from me. In a world where we think of the world as north and south and east and west, develop, developing, Asia the rest, um, it is worth our while turning our attention to a lateral idea of the world, a lateral set of zones of the world. And indeed, this is the oldest way, in terms of the Western world at least, that the world has been viewed. It was Aristotle who first came uh, up with the idea and certainly is recorded as such, as they're suggesting that there are indeed three zones of the world, the frigid zone, the temperate zone, and the torrid zone, the tropics. And in that torrid zone uh, right now, as you'll see, lives an enormous population, uh, is, features enormous biodiversity. And when you just look at the size of the tropics, you look at that area between the Tropic of Capricorn and Cancer, you can begin to understand the enormity of what lies between those two uh, tropics. 
and the importance uh, potentially that uh, that zone of the world presents to us. So why the tropics? Um, there is deep history here, that torrid zone mythology, and indeed part of Aristotle's, uh, Aristotle's idea was that the only place where civilised human beings could live was in the temperate zone, not in the torrid zone where we are right now, and not in the torrid zone where right now we know more than 40% of the world's population live, where about 55% of the world's children live, where about 80% of the world's bio bio biodiversity can be found. Um, and there is a long history, and I have another Another story that I can tell and I've told in various fora where we can trace this sort of negative idea of the tropics. The tropics has been seen over history as either a place of pestilence following Aristotle, or a place of paradise, when you think of the beautiful artwork of Paul Gauguin, you know, the tropical holiday idea, but rarely has it been taken on in its own terms. And given the weight of the world's population, given the importance of the tropics, it is well beyond time for us to take that very seriously. And indeed, um, as uh, we know uh, from the data that we've collected, that in no small way the future of the world depends on what happens in that tropical zone. So um, as a relatively new vice chancellor, one of the challenges before me, uh, being part of a university, which I'll describe a little bit later on uh, as appropriately as Australia's University for the Tropics, that's how we were established and why we were set up in the late uh, 1950s. That was the discussion and 1960 was when the institution began in its then form. The idea at that time, and it was very uh, forward thinking, I think, on behalf of politicians, and sometimes we wonder about whether that's possible these days. But in those days, the idea that the tropical region would be important and that idea emerging in Australia is of particular note at a time when certainly Australia saw itself as a European outpost, as, as really not at all connected to tropical nations of the world. And you know, from time to time, we struggle with that um, even now. But in the late 50s, there was a profound understanding that Australia needed to focus on the tropics. And part of what we're doing here is reprising that. So as a relatively new Vice Chancellor, um, coming in to play a role with my colleagues on focusing on this, these issues of the tropical world, because that's why our university was set up, part of the challenge for us was to think about how do we get others to focus on this idea of the tropics? How do we understand the tropics? How do we raise its profile? How do we make it as much a part of our lexicon, our way of viewing the world, as that North and South and East and West develop, developing Asia, the rest? And we came up with the idea of a project on the state of the tropics. And this idea of this project, uh, in the end, uh, did get legs. And the notion was that we would seek, in the first instance, to answer a very simple research question, the one you can see on the screen there. Is life in the tropics getting better? And when we came up with this idea within the university, it was such a compelling idea, and there's a longer story uh, around this, that in the end, we invited a number of institutions around the world uh, to participate with us on this particular project. And I'm pleased to say that a number did, and you can see those that are there that are very much engaged in this particular project. And, and National University of Singapore, too, was very much engaged um, in the project in the early days as well. Well, we're very grateful for that. So we set up this international consortium and we decided that we would focus on the state of the tropics, try to answer that question in order to come to a view about whether or not the tropics is important or not. I mean, it was an open, it's an empirical question. I mean, really, is it something that we needed to worry about? Uh, and, and was there some um, real meaning, I suppose, and, and real potential in this idea of the tropics? Um, and, um, and ultimately, uh, the work was done. So we started this project in concept in May 2010. Uh, we ended up defining what the project looked like, getting it going in May 2011, and ultimately by the beginning of 2014, the um, work was done in terms of the report, and in the middle of 2014, on the 29th of June uh, 2014, um, Aung, San Suu, uh, Aung San Suu Kyi launched our inaugural report on the state of the tropics. And you can see those words there, or maybe you can't from the back, I don't know, but um, you know, I'm happy to share this with uh, whomever would like to see it. Uh, really what that goes to is um, just describing the fact that we used uh, 47 indicators and came to a view about the tropics. And we certainly came to the view that the tropics is indeed a very important conceptualization. It's a very important 
axis of our understanding of global development, um, and this became plain. And in answer to that question, is life in the tropics getting better? Uh, the answer is yes. However, um, there is extreme variability across the tropical world, and I'm sort of rather ashamed to say that the only area across the tropics that is going backwards on key indicators is the area of Oceania, the Pacific, and the area uh, where Australia exists right now. So we launched that major report to a worldwide audience of about 600 million, uh, 650 million people um, around the world at the time when that actually occurred. Um, in addition, um, a couple of years ago, so I guess it was last year, we had uh, here in Singapore a second report delivered around sustainable development um, in the tropics. And that was a very important moment for us too. Dame Carol Kiddu, as I mentioned, uh, did that for us. So uh, I guess what I want to do in that slide is really point you to the fact that if you go to that website that you can see there, you can learn a whole lot about the tropics. Um, and it is well worthwhile doing that because it is a very potent part of the world and it is one that is in no small way going to help determine really the trajectory of the world. I would also mention that uh, as a result of the work uh, the United Nations elected in 2016, um, the General Assembly voted without dissent to recognise um, an International Day of the Tropics, recognising that particular day, the 29th of June, forever after, um, as the International Day of the Tropics. And that does provide us with an annual opportunity, really, to take stock and to have a think about how we're going as far as the tropics is concerned and what more we should be doing. So uh, I commend the website to you. So what are some of these tropical um, challenges and opportunities and what do they say about sustainable development? I've already mentioned the demographic trends um, and again part of the power of this and, and just spoiler alert again or just to aid your understanding, green is the tropics um, in all of these slides and blue is the rest of the world. So you can see the crossover point there where the tropics, uh, tropic nations of the world um, become more populous overall, which we're expecting to be in the late uh, 2040s or thereabouts. And at that time, the estimate is it will be around 67% of the world's children will live in the tropics. And just stop and think about that for a moment. Just think about that for a moment. We'll have two thirds of the world's children growing up in the tropics. And we need to ensure, in my view, as research institutions, as, as people who have the power to expose, I guess, both um, inequality and challenge, as well as point to solutions in this regard, we need to ensure that there is an opportunity for those children in the tropics to grow up and live a life rich with meaning in their own terms, contribute to the prosperity of their own nations, or else we can't be surprised if there are new waves of, of, um, of radicalisation potentially drawn um, from that sort of disadvantage and that gross inequality that we might see as a result of that. This is coming. We, we know this. Africa is going to be a major part of this story. Uh, there's no doubt about that. South Africa as well. Uh, but across the tropics overall, there are tremendous challenges linked to this great demographic um, growth. And just to give you a sense of the age population, and that's really making the point about that demographic dividend, as the, as the demographers call it, of youth that is going to be coming through the tropical world. Um, that is um, a, a great uh, challenge, but it's also a great opportunity. But it means that we must have regard to what the education and training opportunities will be. And there is no better place, really, for us to be thinking about that and indeed executing strategies in response to it than as Northern Australia and Singapore, and indeed Northern Australia and Singapore in partnership, in my view. Environment and climate change is very significant, and I draw your attention to the chart here. Uh, we know, um, you know, I'm sure, that the expectation is, and the real experience is, that uh, climate change effects are going to be more severe in the tropics, the closer to the equator that you are. Already, um, biodiversity is affected in the tropics. We know the story about uh, many small Pacific island nations and the existential risk that climate change presents to those particular um, entities. Entities. And biodiversity is at risk, and it's something that I probably hadn't thought about enough until I got into some of this. 
mean, we must understand that organisms, whether they're plants or animals, live within a very narrow temperature range in the tropics. You know, we know that here, you know, in Singapore, we know that in northern Australia too. That means their tolerance is very low. And we have live examples, you know, hope live right now, but may not be, examples in Australia. One particular um, beautiful animal, which you might like to Google at some point, called the white lemuroid ringtail possum. It only occurs in a couple of pockets um, in northern uh, Queensland, and there is a, a, a small group um, of these at Mount Lewis inland from Mossman on the north Queensland coast, far north um, Queensland coast, just inland. And over the years, this population has just climbed up the hill, and they've reached the top now. And a few years ago, in a major heat wave, the population was, uh, was knocked enormously. A number of individual animals died. And many people think, in fact, they are um, ecologically extinct. This animal doesn't have enough individuals left in the population in order to sustain it going forward. Uh, that's a real effect of climate change. And long before the first polar bear, which is the poster child for climate change, is affected. No, that's a bit of a, a stretch, but you know what I mean. Polar bears, we're going to be concerned about them too. The reality is you will have the loss of, um, of species. You will have the loss of biodiversity in the tropics, and we're already seeing it right now. So we know that's important. But the chart there that I thought you might find interesting looks at global warming, and it shows that Singapore uh, temperatures have risen almost twice as fast as global temperatures. We think, um, you know, people who advise me on these things, I'm not an expert in, in this at all, that what we're seeing there is an interaction between the effects of climate change and urbanisation um, in Singapore. Um, so Singapore is getting hotter faster. Uh, that's where it is right now. And I know that there is a lot of attention, um, including at our own university, on tropical urban design, sustainable design. And in Singapore as well, I know that there are, um, there's a lot of work in our own people have been over here. And that new Colombo plan that uh, Kate mentioned before, uh, we've had groups of our own students who are studying in master's degrees in this area coming to Singapore um, and doing their studies over here as well. Um, that goes to threatened species. You can see there, um, and again, the tropics versus the rest of the world, just making the point that I'd made uh, before. This next um, slide, I'm sure at the back you're going to struggle to see, but this looks to infrastructure development um, in the tropics. And basically, the takeaway here, and I'm sorry, I've, I've lost the green on that for you. Um, Oh, no, I haven't. I just have on my own copy. So the green is there. So you can see infrastructure development um, and where things appear to be ahead and behind um, uh, for the tropics overall. Interestingly enough, we know that in many of the developing tropical nations, of course, those communities are very well equipped, increasingly well equipped with mobile technology. And so that means that some of the solutions to whether that's the delivery of health services into rural and remote areas or uh, um, educational services becomes po possible. Um, even diagnoses. I know some of our colleagues at JCUS in the past have had a look at um, using apps to diagnose illness um, amongst children by testing their breathing uh, because there is access to that technology and broadband technology access to broadband is growing significantly as well. But it does mean that there is a quantum leap there uh, but it also means that uh, there are opportunities for those of us in the sorts of institutions in which we reside as universities and research institutions to play a role to service those particular needs. Um, again, just a couple of slides which, which show the differences between the tropics and uh, the rest of the world in terms of food production and quality. Um, as you can see there, uh, the proportion of the people who are undernourished on the left-hand side there and the incident of uh, obesity. And some of my colleagues, um, we work with the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine on the state of the tropics work. Um, and as we know, and part of the real challenge for many tropical uh, populations and tropical nations is that they have this double burden of non-communicable diseases, um, so obesity, uh, growing rate or uh, growing sort of heart, uh, cardio um, issues, um, you know, all of the sort of effects, I suppose, of the sorts of Western diets in particular that um, we see. In addition, they, they remain vulnerable oftentimes for, to tropical diseases and in particular neglected tropical diseases. So that's a, an enormous burden on the health systems in those, in those countries. 
This slide uh, and the next couple of slides we um, used recently uh, at a World Health Organization collaborating center uh, session where again it's very interesting uh, through, through the World Health Organization there is a renewed focus on the issues of the tropics as well and, and how that might play out and, and what that means in terms of the sorts of programs that might be supported uh, to advance health worldwide rather than thinking about these things as somehow generic understanding better the needs and the focus that's going to be required in different parts of the world in different zones of the world. So um, here we have um, the health of women and children. So the first goes to maternal mortality uh, rates and the good news is there that that's coming down and has come down significantly in the tropical world and under five mortality also has reduced dramatically over the tropical world and in case you're wondering the red line um, goes to where the sustainable development goals, the UN sustainable development goals indicates that's the target, that's where we should be heading um, as a global community um, and um, and you know clearly oftentimes it's the rest of the world is doing pretty well in that but uh, the tropics um, are not so there are real issues to solve there. Human capacity, um, looking at nurses and midwives and in a moment in physicians. And again, I thought I'd draw out for you some Singapore uh, data there too. Uh, again, the World Health Organization, very interested in seeing what we need to do in terms of the health workforce. Uh, because plainly with that enormous growth in population, the growth in uh, children as well, and the challenges that exist in many developing nations of the world, uh, clearly uh, part of that living a life rich with meaning and prosperity requires good health, uh, plainly, and you need to have the health workforce that's going to be supporting that. So um, you can see how far away from, for example, Australia or Singapore, and indeed the average of the rest of the world, the tropics um, and some of those um, uh, areas are um, in particular. And you know, the part of the challenge here, as you can uh, gather from looking at these towers and, and from looking at the next one too, when you include Northern Australia and Singapore in an assessment of the tropics versus the rest of the world, we sort of skew the data a little bit, if you can, you can appreciate that too, because we make it look a little bit better than it is. So it's very interesting when you parse out some of the, um, the nations like Singapore and Australia that ought to be and are sort of doing better on a number of these indicators, it's then you really get to see the depth of the challenge in aspects of the tropical world. Um, so that's nurses and midwives and, um, and part of a presentation earlier in the year did go to um, maternal and child health and uh, midwifery uh, more broadly. And physicians too. You can see there um, the great discrepancy across the tropical world. And I should have explained that one of the things we did, we do in our work on the state of the tropics is we don't have a league table of nations about which is the most I don't know, um, the best achieving tropical nation and which is the worst. What we tried to do and what we did do is we divided the world up into eight tropical regions and we did that you know, based on a particular set of rules um, and so those are why you see eight, um, eight pillars there. Um, Research capacity, uh, you know, again part of the challenge for us is to understand that oftentimes solutions that emerge from um, Temperate science, if you like, frigid science, temperate science is often not particularly fit for purpose in the tropical world. And yet that is where science is transacted. That is where research is undertaken. Whether that is in science or biomedical science or in the social sciences in terms of adaptation, human adaptation to climate change, for example, most of that knowledge comes from the temperate world. And some of that, of course, is going to be fit for purpose, but oftentimes it isn't. And in my travels, I've heard amazing stories, quite wondrous stories about how um, we've managed to get it wrong. And some of you will have heard this story before. One of my favorites was a fellow I was talking to who was from the Belgian Congo. And he told me about a bridge that was built over a river um, in the Belgian Congo in order to ad advance uh, commerce. And what he said was that uh, money was you know, managed to be squeezed out of Brussels or somewhere or other and they built this bridge and it was wonderful. And then in the first wet season, the road either side of the bridge washed away. So they have a bridge and the engineering of the bridge itself was fine, the bridge was still standing at that time, but it was completely useless because there wasn't the bringing to bear of the tropical expertise and knowledge that 
tropical institutions have, sometimes without even knowing it, because we don't necessarily define it in that way. For us, in terms of our engineering school, this is something that people pay attention to, uh, whether it's around cyclone proofing structures or the demands of managing the built environment in, uh, in a tropical setting. And we, we actually do have knowledge and expertise, we being more broadly, not just James Cook University, but those of us who live and work and care and research in the tropics, we actually do have expertise that's very fungible and very worthwhile sharing. Um, I think it's a great opportunity and a great obligation upon us. So the role of education and research then in promoting a more sustainable tropical world and therefore uh, globally um, greater levels of sustainability, um, there is plainly a great need for what we do in the world, both in Northern Australia and right here in Singapore. One of those does go to training um, the workforce of the future. And similarly, that isn't just the engineers. Um, if you sit back and have a think about it, and hopefully at the end of this evening, when perhaps you might give this another thought and another moment of your time, to have a think about what are some of the other areas we should be considering as we expand our horizons and imagine that there is special knowledge linked to the tropics. One area, um, for example, to go to nursing. Again, we've had at JCU in the past a professor who is doing work on uh, practices around wound healing um, and how you uh, bandage wounds um, in the tropical world. And most of the standards that are taught around the world are Western standards. And we knew, we know, and in fact our professor of nursing knew, that if those were followed in our own environment or in a Singapore environment um, where a bandage was applied in oftentimes, and not always, but in oftentimes uh, an air-conditioned setting in a hospital, by the time that person had left that air conditioned setting, within a couple of hours, the bandage would have fallen off. I'm looking at Z, who's like the expert in all of this, but much, much more and much more deeply involved in the science than, than that particular matter. But there are specifics around education and training that we should be thinking about how we ensure that our graduates are best uh, fit for purpose as they emerge into the tropical world, but how we should be man managing our research and innovation approaches and strategies to ensure we're dealing with these things. For us, uh, the future workforce in the tropics is going to go to these sorts of things and opportunities that we're looking to exploit. The Internet of Things there goes to, of course, the connectivity of, um, of smart devices, whether that's your fridge or your phone or your watch or whatever the case might be. And again, leveraging uh, the opportunity that that presents now in a mobile, mobile technology-enabled um, uh, broader community. For us, um, all of these things are incredibly important, and they exercise us a great deal about what is our unique contribution. How do we reinterpret some of these sorts of endeavours, which will be undertaken in universities and research institutes around the world, but what's our angle on this? What's the specific advantage that we can add um, as we are contemplating the developments in terms of preparing the workforce for the future. In terms of research, you know, we want research excellence with impact like everybody else that engages as well, uh, but we are very focused on the power of our place. We think this is very important and for both Singapore and Australia, our location is a laboratory in important ways and to think about how we might do that I think is very powerful for us. We need to be collaborative and, and to bring to bear um, new ideas and some of those are only ever going to be born from stepping outside of our disciplinary silos. Um, those challenges do require tropical solutions, as I mentioned before, with, um, developed by, with and for the peoples of the tropics. Now, I mentioned earlier, with a light touch, uh, for those of you who aren't aware, that James Cook University was set up to do this very thing. And as I said before, I think it was tremendously for, you know, foresightful in the 1950s and 1960s to imagine that this would be 
um, a mission of some potency and power and relevance to the world overall. So we have a strategic intent. We're very proud to be here at the three tropical campuses, uh, Townsville, Cairns, and of course, Singapore. We have our statement of strategic intent and we have strategic themes. Everything we do as a university needs to line up with one or more of those themes or else we don't do it. Now that doesn't mean you don't do things like accounting, for example, or um, law, because there are expressions of those things, whether that's um, Islamic banking in the case of finance uh, and accounting, or law, the development of governance structures and legal structures. All of this is important. There is potency and power in everything that we potentially do as a university, and we're determined to ensure that we are focused on all of those things. And I love working with the institutions here in Singapore uh, because they too have angles associated with this as well as a more generic uh, push. That's, um, oh, I sort of flicked through two there. Again, for those of you who aren't familiar with the university overall, those are some of our more recent numbers, so you can see in terms of our size. We're a, a sort of medium-sized Australian university. We're not a large university. We're not a tiny university either. We're sort of in the middle there. Um, and um, again, for those of you who might be interested, uh, for our Singapore campus, uh, we have students, as you can imagine, from all over the world, including Australia. We should actually have a line from Australia too. That's a little bit different to our Australian campuses where the home country of the largest group of full degree international students in Australia is the United States. People come to do a lot of their tropical studies and um, uh, associated with um, James Cook University. We're very engaged uh, with the United Nations, not just through that International Day of the Tropics where we had a role to play in terms of the advocacy for that particular development, but the Sustainable Development Goals are something that we committed to very early, in fact the first Australian university to do so, and we're very proud of that because it is part of our DNA. This is part of our DNA and our people um, at JCU cared deeply about this, cared deeply about sustainability, about inequality and about the future of our planet and the role that we can play um, to ensure that there is that brighter future for the tropics worldwide because without that there is not going to be a brighter future for the world um, overall. Um, sustainability is identified as a priority for us in our university plan and we've got a quote there um, from our statement of strategic intent which um, underscores the importance of that for us. Um, I was speaking to somebody recently um, at the UN about how things were coming along with the SDGs and, um, you know, not so well, I guess, um, is the answer at this point in time. On that State of the Tropics report, we will be doing another broad brush report in 2020 and checking progress. Um, is life in the tropics getting better? Um, we'll be, you know, having a look at that in, and interacting that with the, the Sustainable Development Goals to see whether we've gone ahead or gone backwards. Um, I'm sure we probably will have gone ahead, but again, I expect it'll be variable. It'll be very patchy. I do think that there is a unique opportunity for Australia and Singapore. And that comprehensive strategic partnership that Kate mentioned in her opening remarks uh, is central to this. And I just think, you know, I just take my hat off to both governments and certainly to our Prime Ministers who signed that, our Prime Ministers Lee and Turnbull. Um, it was an amazing moment to imagine that we would have this special relationship and this conduit between the two countries that it's a platform that enables us to do so very much more than we're doing right now. Uh, we were very proud as part of that agreement to be recognised with university status, the only Australian institution in Singapore to be so formally recognised. Um, and we take that really as a challenge to us to continue to play the role that we can and should be playing uh, both in the tropics more broadly, here in Singapore and for Singapore, adding to the national talent pool of Singapore, conducting research of great purchase and relevance to Singapore and as well as Northern Australia and therefore to the tropics worldwide. We are both high income nations. We have a significant footprint in the tropics. There is power in our partnership. NTU is an enduring partner with that state of the tropics, as I mentioned. And for JCU, we, we talk about tri-city integration. Um, it's a funny thing. We were talking about that just amongst ourselves, a group of us earlier today. In some universities and in some institutions would 
um, conceptualise a campus in Singapore or China or wherever, an international campus, as that, as an international campus or a transnational campus, a branch campus. This is not how we conceptualise our Singapore um, you know, our Singapore operation at all. This is genuinely a part of our university. We are one university in two countries with three tropical campuses. There are differences, you know, between the two by virtue of being in a different regulatory environment, a different legislative environment, but for us, we take the Singapore campus as seriously as we do our other two. And the Australian Government's new Colombo plan that Kate mentioned, and I would say she's not here, so we'll be spared her blushes, she did an amazing job on behalf of the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade in getting this up and running and ensuring that in the first three years of its operation, 10,000 Australian students participated in a mobility program. This is without precedent and without Kate's leadership on this, I'm sure it wouldn't have happened you know, as, as it did. She, uh, she's a real champion as far as that's concerned. You heard tell uh, that we've got a very special day for us tomorrow. We're going to be launching, and the Minister will be doing the honours for us, the JCU Tropical Futures Institute. This has been long in gestation. We first started talking about this a very long time ago. Uh, we will have two initial pillars as far as this is concerned, aquaculture, and that will be uh, hate, you know, fast followed by allied health as well. And we're wanting to leverage our relationships and our work, uh, again, to give back to Singapore uh, and to learn what we can and to work together to ensure that we are together uh, focused in the issues of the tropical world. Of course, um, we have a, a broader array of uh, research that goes on in our university University, both in Singapore and outside of it. And I just thought I'd share with you um, a couple of those people. Dean Jerry. Um, I'm not sure whether Dean is here. Oh, there he is. There you are, hiding. I was sort of looking out for you before. There you are. First man on my list there, um, who is um, our Dean of Research here in Singapore, but um, a person of, uh, of great uh, note and power in the aquaculture world, an outstanding uh, researcher um, in that, uh, and practitioner in that world, industry-related uh, practitioner in that world. Um, and I'll just let you run your eyes through, um, through some others. Um, Norell and Bill. Um, I also thought I'd share with you others you know, who, whose work I think has purchase here uh, too. Uh, Sasha Aikenbell uh, do, does a lot of work in linguistics, um, which I, is a fascinating work. Uh, Terry Hughes on coral reef studies and, uh, and Alex um, in immunoparasitology. Um, just um, been responsible for and leading a spin out uh, for us at the moment. It's a really exciting thing. So ladies and gentlemen, as I'm drawing this to an end, uh, really this is my concluding slide, uh, I'm wanting to encourage us all to think about the tropics, and I'll say that again, to think about the tropics, to think about this zonal take on the world and what that might mean, both in terms of the obligation, a moral obligation that I believe we have as developed nations of the world, and the opportunities that that presents, so that the very best work that we can do is work that will make a difference to the peoples and the nations of the tropics. Singapore and Australia are uniquely placed to make a difference as far as this is concerned. We are determined you know, to be an active participant in this. We are determined to deliver, to deliver that brighter future for life in the tropics worldwide um, as James Cook University, but in strong and enduring partnership with our colleagues here in Singapore and around the world. So ladies and gentlemen, that's my speech for you tonight. Thank you very much for your attention. I really appreciate that and I'm very open to any questions or comments you might have. Thank you.